Hey, it's Keisha here with Defending the Early Years podcast. We'll be focusing on amplifying the voices of early childhood educators, advocates, and all of those who love children. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Defending the Early Years podcast. I am thrilled to be here today with Alia Stouffer Kolazak. She is a force to be reckoned with. I was lucky enough to meet her this year at NACI, but prior to meeting her in the flesh, I have seen her work. I have communicated with her online and we have shared passions. So I am pleased to introduce you guys all to Alia. Alia has a master's degree in early childhood education and she went to Bank Street College, which is like the, I mean, I think Bank Street is one of the premier early childhood colleges or colleges that focus, um, have a strong focus on early childhood education, um, education in general, and a lot of social justice work. She has been teaching in preschool, kindergarten, and first grade classrooms in New York City, Vermont, and Massachusetts. And she founded her own program. And what was so cool about her program was that it was a farm-based program, um, originally called Farmhands Preschool, more recently has undergone some um, radical change that she's going to share with us today. So, Alia, hello and welcome. Hi, Keisha. Thank you. Hello. That was like a, quite the introduction. You are a busy lady. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. It's it's strange to hear all that being said out loud. So I'm I'm so curious. I'm I'm most curious about um you going from working with older children and how did you end up with younger children? Like how did you get to where you are now? What was the shift that made you, you change from um you know, classroom setting to where you are now? Yeah. Um, well, I, when I started out uh, working at a um, progressive elementary school, pre K through eighth grade um, Manhattan Country School in the city that was founded by um, a bunch of parent and teacher activists um, in the movement in, in, 1966 and was just smitten and knew that I had found my life's work when I, I started there in my twenties. And, um, and they're the ones who sent me to bank street and said, you should, you know, pursue some studies there. And I thought I would be a kindergarten public school teacher, you know, for life that just it mm-hmm. felt like five was my age. Um, and it, it just all felt like it fit, but then Um, When I got my first um, teaching job, public school, uh, K-1 class on the Lower East Side um, in New York City, um, it quickly became clear to me that it was not what they called the child's garden that I was learning about at Manhattan Country School and at Bank Street, where the emphasis was on, um, you know, authentic progressive education and, but I kept trying, I tried, uh, you know, so public school on the Lower East Side in Manhattan with 22 students from, you know, just turning five all the way up to almost seven, um, with no assistant and a big school mm-hmm. to Vermont, like north of Putney. So very rural, 12 students, public kindergarten with an assistant and all kinds of supports. And even in, you know, those two extremes, I still felt like I couldn't do my best work because I was so bogged down by standards and academic Mm -hmm. pressure and um, a bunch of BS. I don't know if I can say that word. Yeah. (laughs) I was, I was getting ready to chime (laughs) in and say, (laughs) it sounds like, even with some of the things that we think are the fix, right? Mm-hmm. Lower numbers, more okay. support, all those things. You still have that top down paperwork, the standards, the, all of that, uh, the, the policy that right. still hinders us. 
and that you have to spend so much time and energy on, right? Mm -hmm. And and then where is the time and energy left for the the most important piece, right? Which is like Mm -hmm. what the children and uh, teachers are experiencing together um, and the play and the learning and the growth and all of that. Um, And so I just kept kind of moving younger because I realized in order to be able to, um, you know, practice the craft and support uh, children and and young humans in the way that I felt passionate about, I had to, um, I had to get out of kindergarten. So I started working in preschools and, um, you know, so I've done all those ages, toddlers, I haven't done infants yet, but Mm -hmm. Um, I stuck mostly with fours and threes and then toddlers. And I ended up opening my own program when I had my own babies and realized that I had to support my family and that nobody was going to let me bring my own babies to school. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I was going to ask you, because I think one of the, the largest hurdles for teachers who are currently in a system that may not sit right in their heart is... The financial burden. So it's yeah. like, okay, this isn't working for me, but it pays better than preschool. Right. But it pays, it might in a lot of cases pay better than private school or any school that's going to yeah. give them a little more autonomy. And the benefits are better. And, you know, a lot of times summers are off, the hours work for parents. So it's, it's um, often a burden for people. So, yeah. Um, I think that's why there's this cycle of stuckness sometimes. Mm -hmm. So for you, the solution was opening your own program. Right. And it didn't work at first because I'm not, I didn't study business, right? Like I didn't know a lot about being an entrepreneur or uh, business plans or budgets, but um, Mm -hmm. I, my, my part, my then partner was out of work. I had to support my family. And just exactly like you said, I knew I was, going to have to make a public school salary to do that. And that I, they definitely, I, I had waited my whole life, right? Like I'm a kid person. I had waited my whole life to Mm -hmm. have my own babies. And I was just like, there's no way I'm going to pass someone else, my babies now that I finally got here. So I can go, um, grow and learn with other people's babies. So, Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I opened a family childcare. It was very small. Uh, like, you know, six two-year-olds and myself, and I had a one-year-old at that time and, um, and uh, almost three-year-old. And, and so, yeah, that was in 2011. And um, I did a terrible. You said that was, you said that initial program was in your home? It wasn't, it was a a family child care, but um, you know, most people have that license and use it in their own home. It's, it's not, required to be in your own home. So I had some friends, um, I actually had started a business with a couple of other moms I met Mm. um, at our local, um, you know, new mom, new parent group called Beyond Birth at the hospital, and um, that other agricultural educators. And so we started a business, the Farm Education Collaborative, as an LLC at that time, starting with summer camps, and we all had babies. And then I started my school as a as a kind of an arm under that um, umbrella. Um, And I started on a farm, an uh, organic um, CSA, community supported agriculture farm in our city, Northampton, run by two um, friends that I had gone to college with at at Hampshire College for undergrad. Um, And they had an extra room um, with a kitchen in it. And they Mm -hmm. had a toddler and a five-year-old. So we just kind of um, collaborated to make that happen. Yeah, that sounds like the my story. Really? <laughs> yes. Yep. I, I was a, a home based program, and it was not in my own home. It was in the home of someone who I collaborated with. They had yeah. an extra room, extra space. They heard me say, "I'm done with this. You know, I want to start my own program. I can't do it this way anymore." And that was the beginning of it. So that's that's cool. So cool. <laughs> Yeah, I love it. And that feels like such a mom thing or like a, a a parent, you know, primary parent thing where you're like, okay, this step, then this step, 
and now this Mm -hmm. and like kind of putting puzzle pieces together to figure out how to make it work. Yep. When there's all of these, you know, pressures and structures and pieces of the kind of like typical puzzle or conventional puzzle Mm -hmm. that don't work. Yeah. And one thing about, um, moms and dads and parents and adults who are in charge of children is we sure can be creative, right? Yeah. <laughs> when we have to make it work. Yes. <laughs> awesome. So you started w- there and you had the luxury of being on a farm. I mean, wow. How did that look? Yeah. Um, it, it was, it was totally dreamy because this farm, it, they were, I don't know, maybe five to seven years old already. So they were in, you know, big production for uh, maybe like a hundred or 150 families. And so there's, you know, tractors zipping around. There are uh, baby goats being born. There's, um, we would spend, you know, like hours kind of uh, rolling around in, long beds of organic strawberries with like the juice dripping down our chins and then (laughs) getting back, you know, to the classroom and, and freezing strawberries and jamming strawberries. And just, you know, we were kind of, um, for those first few, few, few years, just, we didn't have to plan anything because it was all, (laughs) it was just like everything around us, you know, was life is the learning, right? Exactly what we wanted to be doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. wow yeah it was um idyllic um and tricky of course because like that first year I I ended up making like eleven dollars an hour or something because I Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to do a budget and so um you know fast forward to now it's so it's 2011 so we're about 11 and a half years old now um and we are Two classrooms, um, about 25 families, um, six full-time educators, a few part-time educators, um, and and still trying to grow. Um, yeah. and, and what would you say, in, in those years, what would you say has been the biggest change? Like, I know that you're really... Um, intentional and really going through a shift in um, programming, what has been, I guess, before I ask you what's been the biggest change, what was the catalyst for, for um, this growth or the changes that you've been making as of, as of late? Mm -hmm. Um, Well, the first, the first change was, Go, um, changing from one classroom to two classrooms, which was in 2014. And that was, a lot of it has been really community-based. You know, we're set right outside the downtown area of Northampton, which is a pretty small city. It's like 30,000 people, um, but it's a neighborhood. There's a lot of houses down here and farm fields. So it's, it's um, pretty idyllic in that we can be we have a lot of green space. There's woods nearby where we tap, you know, maple trees um, in the early spring. But, and there's a lot of people too that we're connected with, right? Like we go to neighbors' houses who invite us to harvest their conquered grapes every year. There's like somebody with a parakeet that invites us in to visit, you know? So there's, we're really part of a community and not all the families who are um, part of our school live here, but there are plenty of them that do that can walk and bike, um, and then from surrounding towns as well. But there was a family who had their first child with us, and then their second child came along and was ready to go to um, to school or childcare, and we weren't going to have space. So they kind of collaborated with their um, parents and some other people and put on an addition to another home in the neighborhood that's just a short walk from the first classroom for us to be able to have a second classroom. Wow. And yeah, and then like during the, you know, um, the pandemic started and we had already had a plan with the farmers from our original place that we were needed to move out by 20, 
was it 2020 or 2021? And we thought we were going to have all the time in the world to figure that out. And then it was COVID and it wasn't a time where we were going to be able to find a property or build a school building. And so some other neighbors collaborated with us, um, another family who had their child in our program to put up a yurt in their, on their property. And so it's really been like step-by-step the community Mm -hmm. figuring it out together. Um, That really says a lot about the impact your program has had on the community and the, the connection that you've made, because I mean, I haven't seen anything like that where I live, where, where families are willing to give that much and to be that, um, an integral part of a program. And that says a lot about the impact. So you should be really proud of that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And we, that was something that early on, we were thinking a lot about how, how can we, um, that, that we want to prioritize the needs, not just of the children and, um, certain, um, members of our community, certain identity groups and the needs of the teachers but also the caregivers and the parents and, you know, extended family as well. And really thinking about, we are doing this most important work, right? We are raising our babies and children Mm -hmm. together. And how can we spend so much time, so many hours of the day with these um, young beings and then the, the home caregivers and parents spending so much time with them, but not much time you know, we have a couple conferences a year. How can we, how can we have that little uh, amount of time and space for deep conversations? And so Mm -hmm. we started these um, events called community engagement nights or sense in 2014, where, and we have, you know, like between four and six a year where there's um, you know, free pizza dinner and childcare for the children in one of the classrooms. And then all the adults gather, um, parents, teachers, extended family, translators, because there are a lot of, um, languages, um, in our community. And we talk about hard things, basically. I mean, parents suggest topics, you know, the first one that we ever had, I led, which was gender 101. Um, and, And then we do a huge amount about racial identity development. We do, you know, parents ask us to do things. I don't know how to talk about death with my child, right? And so Uh we'll bring in um, experts from the community as well. And we've been leaning more toward that as we've become a much more racially uh, and um, economically diverse community and, and school that we have relied more on. Um, facilitators from outside of the school to support us on an ongoing, like consistent basis in figuring out how can we create authentic, respectful, supportive community, which so many families and humans are missing, right? Yeah. In, In modern society and that that that's the best we can, we can provide for our children. That whole thing of like, put the oxygen mask on yourself first before Um, Mm -hmm. and are your it sounds like your parents are very engaged and they they really um accept this offer and 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 are collaborative do you find that um that was challenging or were they immediately engaged like what what were your strategies to welcome and engage parents i already heard some of them which was like um translators which is amazing um, their questions being the questions, as opposed to you just giving down information, you're taking their questions and, and like having that be the catalyst for the conversation. I think that's definitely um, a big way to get buy in. But are there any other things that you think were the key? Because I, I often hear when I'm when I'm presenting educators saying parents aren't involved or um, parents are uninterested or, you know, I planned this meeting and no one showed up. So what are some ways or tips or ideas that you can give people out there who are struggling with this? Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, I think, you know, sometimes, well, 
it's pretty small. Like I said, it's 25 families so far. And so who knows how this will continue on as we grow. But I, there's a piece where sometimes families will say, or a parent will say, you know, when we go around at the beginning of an event, like, um, you know, what brought you here or what, what are you looking for? What's your, your goal? People will say clearly, well, I came because Alia, I, I would feel guilty to, uh, about the way, you know, Alia <laughs> pressured me to do it. And I'm like, Okay, great. That's a reason. Sure. I can relate to that. Show up because I gave you the stink eye. That's fine. Um, I just want you here. But that's, you know, I think also the the biggest reason is probably because of how transparent I am and we are about it, even at the time of enrollment, right? And so Mm -hmm. we're, we're, I'm trying that. That's what feels like the whole trajectory of my figuring out how to be a leader is becoming more transparent every month, every year, like Mm -hmm. say more about what it is we're doing. Say like, just be as clear and as detailed as possible. So people, because what we're doing here and what we're talking about and what we're focusing on and what we're not shying away from is not very typical. And so people really need to know. So then, so talking about these community engagement nights and talking about that, that kind of level of buy-in with families who come, uh, I think then we attract families who are looking for that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the ones who are not go running and that's that, that yeah, part. Exactly. <laughs> it's very clear. It's very clear. Um, so you lay out the expectation of, of participation from day one. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, especially, you know, um, but we, we also want, uh, because we um, we are a social justice school, we are an aspiring abolitionist school, and we are, you know, constantly working and working more and more as we age on decentering whiteness, centering Black joy, um, and being a place not only that is attractive for Black and Brown teachers to work and Black and Brown families to join but a place that they're going to want to stay, right? Not just the part mm-hmm. of like show up, but what, what are we, what are we working on here where that we're creating together, where it's not just, you know, all are welcome here, but this is, this was created with you in mind. This, this mm-hmm. was created by all of us. With yeah. Yeah. All of us in mind. So that, um, that piece uh, it, it's so I, I don't even know if it's an expectation like we don't ever want people to feel pressured because we're our mission set statement says we are prioritizing um, the the people and groups who are you know most marginalized and most have been uh, most excluded from having this kind of experience you know outdoor education earth-based education progressive um, education, that kind of thing. And so if, um, there, there's a lot of single parents, there's a lot of parents who, you know, work, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, not the typical, not nine to five shift. Um, and so we're obviously not going to pressure a parent who can't make the events that, that we put together, but we are going to work with parents to make the events work for as many people. Exactly. Right? Like, yeah. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. And so um, have you uh, something that you, you touched on a little bit is the social justice aspect of your work and the abolitionist aspect of your work. Have you had any, um, we, t- we talked about buy-in. Have you had any pushback? Like, have you had any parents who maybe even someone who initially signed on later, um, be challenged to the point of, you know, questioning that? How, how is that working? Yes. It's funny you ask, because <laughs> we're having a <laughs> thing happen right now. Um, very, very recently, um, we're um, having questions about how much teachers share um, about, you know, 
racial trauma and violence um, mm-hmm. and with what age? Mm-hmm. And that's a question. That's a question, right? Like yeah. people have different teachers and theorists and experts in the field debate that question. There's a lot of different ideas about mm-hmm. how much and when. And so um, we're having that that exact conversation. Um, someone feeling surprised that um, their, you know, young child was um, introduced to the idea that um, Dr. King uh, was, you know, shot and killed and Mm -hmm. his um, important work was ended too soon and abruptly. Um, and then having a question about whether that's appropriate or not. And there's, I mean, that, that piece is not ever the focus of our work when we're thinking about justice work, we're talking about, um, upstanders and heroes and change makers. And we're thinking about our work as change makers and activists in the world. It's, it's not, we're not, um, going to those places of every point of the difficult history as a place to focus, but we also aren't going to um, deny the answer to children's questions. And Mm -hmm. we're going to be truthful and open and honest about what happened. And we, we feel like, I mean, in, in this case, a teacher, um, the teacher who was talking about what was like the person who shared this information is saying, you know, maybe I wouldn't say that the next time, but we're also a place where risk-taking and experimentation is Mm -hmm. part of growing and learning for the children and for the grownups and where mistakes can be made. Not that that was necessarily a mistake. mistake. Yeah. But But where you feel comfortable to take the risk. Exactly. Because when people say, oh, no, don't do that, that, that is going, that is going to cause harm to my child or, or these children. You know, what I think always is like, what we've tried thus far hasn't worked. So Mm like, as far as figuring out how to um, dismantle white supremacy, right? So like, Mm -hmm. let's, let's try all the options. Let's be creative with how we are going to um, work on and think about and discuss and read about what's going on in the world and what's going on for, for humans. And, and here it is, you know, most often student led. Mm -hmm. So when that parent did push back, Mm -hmm. what is now, what's the next steps there? Does it also take the same form as the collaborative, work that everything else takes so is it a discussion that happens amongst the staff and all the parents or just that parent what does that um what does that figuring out look like Mm -hmm. yeah we so it started with a conversation with the staff and then um staff like the teaching team and the parents discussing the issue and and hearing each other um, and really working on, you know, active listening um, from both sides, like the perspective and the feelings. And that, that always is helpful, even if there still isn't agreement just to really be human together and, and, and speak from a, a place of, you know, personal experience and sharing. Um, And then it will be followed by a conversation with um, the whole community. We have had many less community engagement nights since the pandemic um, for obvious reasons. And we tried to do some Zoom, you know, but everybody is so zoomed out. Zoomed out. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, We we didn't do a lot. And so we're at a kind of strange place because Mm -hmm. it's been so long. So the, the parents and the families who are here now are at a place that feels different because that was so much part of our culture. Um, And so we're coming back to that, you know, this spring. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the first, um, the first topics that we will gather around is 
that question. Um, mm-hmm. That's one of the things that I'm feeling as well. I'm feeling that difference in, I mean, it's coming back. The connection is coming back, but you can, you can really see how important those relationships and that physical connection is when it's gone. Right. So um, I'm happy to hear that for you. It's also coming back um, after the pandemic, but it is, it's a, we're, we're in a um, working with children so young that, you know, two years, three years, you have a lot of times you might have different families, completely different children because they just grow, you know, unless you have a family that has multiple children, you're starting with a whole new group of parents who ev- who never knew your program before COVID or my program before COVID. So it's this new fabric that we have to weave together. Um, it's, it's just rebuild, regrow, right? No, it's so strange. And I find myself like getting tired of hearing myself say, yes, well, we used to, <laughs> yeah, before in the before times this, but like, it's just, yeah, it doesn't mean much to, to yeah. those families who haven't experienced it. Um, it's a tricky thing. It is. Well, you know, I have learned so much. I resonate so much with your story and um, I hope, and I'm sure that everyone else has, because these are tough topics. It's, it's, it's a tough topics. And it's also for, in some cases, completely opposite of what programs do as far as parent engagement, as far as, um, you know, making sure that our programs are designed for all children, mm-hmm. all families, not just the dominant child in the dominant family, but a more diverse community. And I mean that racially diverse. I mean that um, socially, uh, I'm sorry, uh, economically diverse and in, in so many other ways, uh, uh, neuro, neurologically diverse, just right. thinking in terms of um, all of the people. And that is a phenomenal goal that you have. And I just see your intention. I see your work. I'm far away from you and I see your work. So I can't imagine <laughs> what the, the community sees. Um, I would, if you have a way for people to contact you or a website that they can go to, I would love for you to give it now because it's inspirational. Thank you so much, Keisha. And I, I mean, I think I've said this to you before that i am been a fan of yours and admiring your work for so long. So it means so much to me to hear compliments from you oh um, well you're back like at you <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, so. i mean it does help to have programs that inspire you because yes. i know that just in in this even before covid you know we're so far apart but we do have facebook we do have you know zoom meetings and we do have annual conferences where we can come together and the one thing that I say that ties us all together is our true passion for young children and families. And I just want to make sure that everyone can get in contact with you. Um, not, you don't have to give us your phone number, <laughs> but that everyone can find <laughs> your program as just another um, wonderful option for inspiration so that we can just keep sharing and learning from each other to create a wonderful world for young children. Yes, that's exactly it. Okay, so we have a website um, that is preschoolseedsforjustice.com. Okay, preschoolseedsforjustice.com. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, can you tell us the name of your school? Because you, you told us, I think you mentioned the name, the original name. What's the current name? What's the new name? The current name is New Village. New Village. And mm-hmm. it's very fitting. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. I love that model. I feel like you need to write a book because the the model that you're going towards is what I think is um, a big part of what's going to fix this system that we're in. I was, before I was talking to you, I was talking to teacher Tom Mm. and um, he and I talk a lot about a model that's very similar 
it's so cool. it's going to take the whole village. It's going to take the whole village. This is not something where we could separate the child from the adult and 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 just think it's going to work. That's not how we have been evolutionary evolutionarily and that's not how it's going to work now. So, thank yeah. you so much for setting a model for us all. Thank you, Keisha. Um, and we're trying to, you know, we're trying to grow and we're trying to do exactly that. Like be a school mm-hmm. that's four or five or more classrooms and write a book and be, you know, welcoming people to our school. But we, because we prioritize thriving salaries for teachers and mm-hmm. um, accessible tuition for families, we never save any money. But now yep. we are a nonprofit. <laughs> We just became a nonprofit for real. So we are looking if anybody has ideas and wants to get in touch about how we are going to figure out grants or loans or whatever it is so that we can have a school building because we're still renting. We're still in yurts where we, Mm -hmm. you know, carry in water and have a composting toilet. So we're we're like bumped up against this kind of hurdle, which is like, how are we going to get to the next step? So open Mm -hmm. to ideas. Awesome. So if you have money, send it her way. (laughs) Thank you so much. (laughs) I'll have a wonderful rest of your day and goodbye, everybody. Bye, Keisha. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that was another episode of the Defending the Early Years podcast. Defending the Early Years works to support the rights and needs of young children nationally. Learn more at DEY.org. Pay us a visit sign up for our newsletter or connect with us on social media. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.